around Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers. And that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Chester had been helping me with some paperwork after the regular day ended, and we didn't get through until about 10 o'clock. And we were both kind of tired. Well, I sure never did think I'd hold out, Mr. Dillon. I got a cramp in my hand and a crick in the neck. What I need is a beer. <laughs> I'll join you, Chester. I locked up the office and walked down to the Texas Trail with Chester. I guess the best thing that could be said for the night was that it was still. Not cold, not warm. Somewhere in that between that makes you wish it would be one thing or the other. Or maybe it was because we were tired that it didn't feel right. The bar wasn't crowded, and right off, Kitty came over to our table with beer. I thought she looked kind of worried. Hard day, Matt? Oh, no. No, nothing much. Oh. I declare, Miss Kitty, this beer tastes darker than usual. New brew, probably, Chester. Yeah, I suppose. Say, Matt, you ever seen the stranger before? The tall one, the bar? Huh? Ah, no, no. My heavens, Mr. Dillon, he is a lofty man, and that's for sure. Look at him stretch out. Yeah. What about him, Kitty? Well, I don't know. Sam gave me the eye a bit ago, just before you came in. Huh? You trying to make trouble? Sam's not sure. The fellow's been drinking straight for more than two hours, and he doesn't say anything. He just looks like he's getting ready. Maybe waiting for something. Yeah. Is the woman with him? Yeah. He was a lean, almost stringy man, better than usual tall. And he might have served in the army once because he wore his gun butt forward. As we sat, Chester and me drinking our beer, he turned around a couple of times and looked at the door. I never saw a man with eyes as gray or with a skin to his face so dry and tough you'd swear you could get sparks off it with a flint. The woman standing next to him talked loud and often, but he didn't appear to be listening much. It was like Kitty said, he, he was waiting. About an hour went by, and the place began to quiet down. Most of the men drifted out to... Wherever their way was taken. Oh, excuse me, Mr. Dillon. You uh, want to get on back, Chester? Well, yes, sir. I was thinking about it. This beer is so dark, it's making me sleepy. <laughs> well, you go ahead. I'll see you in the morning. You staying? Yeah, yeah, for a while, I think. On account of that tall fellow? Yeah, maybe. Guess I'll get a little whiskey and sugar. Might keep me awake. No, you go on, Chester. It's all right. Jack, how long you If it's all the same to you, Mr. Dillon, I ain't sleepy. But Jack, okay. I'm tired. There's a hotel down the way, miss. That could put you up. You. Shut up. Nobody asked you. Oh, now, Jack, you ain't got no call to talk to the man like that. Just being helpful. Say, Mr. Dillon, Chester, be quiet. Honey, I'm tired. I want to go to bed. Yeah. Trip on the stage and traveling all day. I, 
I swear I've never been so... You talk too much. Be quiet. Stay in here with me. But Jackie... You've been talking ever since we come in here. Stop or I'm going to hit you. Might not be a bad thing if you did, Mr. Dillon. If there's anything in this world I hate, it's a woman who does nothing but clobber her guns. Uh, Kitty. I bet he is miserable to be wed to, though. What do you reckon ailing him? I don't know, Chester. You're still here, hmm? Uh, yeah. Uh, sit down a minute, will you, Kitty? Yeah, sure. You, uh, don't know their names, do you? No. I came in on the six o'clock stage from Oklahoma Territory. That's all I know. She's been talking a lot, but mostly about clothes and liquor. He don't say anything. Yeah. You think they're married? She's wearing a ring. Mm-hmm. I've never seen a man drink as much, Matt. It's like water with Honey! Him. Hey, you! Honey! Uh, yeah. <laughs> Excuse me, Matt. Yeah, sure. Drink then, sure. What do you want to drink? Huh? Sure. Huh? You want this? Oh, you want whiskey and sugar? Thank you, honey. Sure. Where do you think you're going? I'm going to freshen up, Jack. I'm coming right back. See you do. The woman had just got out of sight when we heard the horses coming down the street outside. There were only six of us left in the place. Sam, Kitty, Chester, and me, the stranger at the bar, and a cowboy sleeping it off at a table across the room. The tall man called Jack, with the sound of the horses, turned to the door, and there was a gun in his hand. You fellas at the table, get up. Come over here. Boy. <coughs> Well, I kind of wondered what you were waiting for. I know you've been wondering. That's why you've been hanging around. I don't want no trouble with you. you stay out of the way, you won't get hurt. Why don't you put your gun away, mister? Don't bother me. There's trouble coming through that door any minute. Put it back. I don't allow gunplay in Dodge. What you allow ain't up to you now, mister. If you're in trouble, it's my job to protect you and your wife. This is private trouble. You want part of it, I'll give it to you right now. In the belly. Jack, they're here, outside. Yeah, I know. We can get out the back. I ain't running no more. You either. Come on, get behind the bar. Yeah, honey. You two fellas aren't hit your belts. Leave them lay where they fall. Go on. Honey, you give me a gun, will you? I'll give you one, I'll give you one. Wait a minute. Okay. Now you two get around behind the bar. All right. At the end. You. You and the lady. Well, listen, you can't shoot up this place. Sam, do what he says. Chester and I did as we were told and got behind the bar along with Kitty and Sam. The tall man picked up our guns and tossed one to the woman then dropped the others beside him on the floor. And then we waited. All of us behind the bar, except for the cowboy drunk asleep at the table. I only had that mirror in for a month. It's going to be busted for sure. Honey, we should have kept going. Got the train in the morning for the west. We'd have had to stop somewhere. This is as good a place as any. Listen, mister, I'm going over and get the boy sleeping at the table there. He's going to get hurt. You move an inch from where you're at and I'll shoot you. Now shut up, all of you. I hear him out there. Yeah. Start shooting when that door swings in. Mr. Dillon? Shh. We... Stay down, Kitty. Don't worry, Matt. There's a figure. Uh, Stop talking to the They'll be in a saloon. Sure. Oh, I know, Farrell. Mm-hmm. Well, come on. Might as well start looking in here. Yeah, well, okay. Right. Let's do it a drink. 
They're in. The shooting went on for about five seconds, and when the glass started to come down behind us, we covered up. And at that, I felt a warm trickle along the side of my face where a splinter had slashed me. There wasn't anybody behind the bar hurt beyond a scratch or two from the glass. But out there by the door and sprawled out beyond onto the walk were four men. They never had a chance. They'd never have another. Watch out for the glass, Jack. We got him, we got him. Yeah. Yeah, we got him, honey. When I'm still alive. Who is it? It's Acton. Let me. <laughs> Never did like him. Come on, let's go. All right, Jackie. Sorry we messed up your place, honey. Don't you try coming after us, mister. Jack's had a taste of blood. Come on, come on. Jackie, we're going to have to ride now? Yeah. Oh, honey, I'm tired. I'll take it easy later. Oh, yeah. Are you all right, Kitty? No, I, I think so. Hey, look at that mirror. Just look at it. What happened? Chester, get some guns from the office. Saddle up and get back here, huh? Yes, sir. Yeah, all right now, folks. There's just been a little shooting, that's all. Everything's going to be just... Kitty, yeah. get Doc quick. What is it, man? This man isn't dead. Huh? Well, go on, hurry up, will you? Well, yeah, sure. And she ran out into the night for Doc. And I stayed in the Texas Trail watching the life flow out of the bullet hole in the chest of the man the killers had called Acton. We will return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, you can help your fighting men and our children win the fight for life if you act now. On the battlefront, our fighting men need blood to replace the precious substance they have so valiantly lost. Only through contributions to your Red Cross fund drive can we keep up that lifeline of blood to our wounded men. But time is running out. Give now. Your Red Cross must also have funds to transform blood into anti-polio serum. The polio season is just around the corner. Red Cross Gamma Globulin is the one weapon that will spare our children from death or the crippling paralysis of polio this summer. Polio won't wait. Your community, your neighbors, perhaps your own child, can be saved from the horrible effects of the dread disease if we do something now. Your Red Cross will not distribute the anti-polio serum. It will be sent to critical areas by government health agencies. There will not be enough to protect every child this year, but many thousands will be spared polio paralysis this summer because you gave to your Red Cross. When your Red Cross fund volunteer calls, give generously. Do it today. You give, they live. Now, the second act of Gunsmoke. <laughs> His eyes were open, but he didn't see me. And when I talked to him, he didn't hear. While I waited for Doc, I went through his papers. His name was Brad Acton. That's all I could find. About two minutes later, Kitty came back with Doc. It didn't take Doc long to shake his head. Oh, the poor fella. He's done that. There's not a living chance. Yeah, if I could just get him to talk. We gotta find out who he is and what they've done, those two. I don't know. He's pretty near gone. We can't. Yeah. Acton. Acton, can you hear me? Acton. Acton. Acton, that fella, Jack Farrow. He and the woman. What did they do? Oh, there's no use. Matt, he Acton. can't say nothing. Now listen to me, Acton. Matt. Acton, who are they? 
Why did they shoot you? He's trying, the poor devil. He just Come on, can't... come on. Now you're wasting time. I gotta get after him. Now what did they do? I'm dying. I'm dying. We've all gotta die. Oh, Matt. That... that ain't kindly, mister. Now I want you to wake up. You hear what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. I hear you. If I was on my feet... Now, listen to me. I'd... Pharaoh. I heard you call him Pharaoh. And a woman. Now, what about him? Why did you come gunning for him? Yeah. Had it come. Why? What did they do? It don't matter now. It matters. If you're gonna die, get it off yourself. Now, come on. You and your pals there. If you did nothing wrong, you'll die more comfortable. Oh, Matt, let him be. It's not Matt, fair. Don't. What about it, Acton? Matt, no, you That's can't. That's enough, Doc. Acton. California. Out in California. Pharaoh, me, and the boys. We held up a stage in Pharaoh. Took the money and lit out with that woman. We we've been following. You look out for her. She's mean with a gun. Martha Lou. Yeah, he's gone, Matt. Yeah. I guess you had to do it that way, Matt. But... But what? <clears throat> Nothing. All set, Mr. Dillon. All right, Chester. You going after him, Matt? Why not? They've done murder, haven't they? You have to figure the odds of a man forgiving you for what you do when a thing has to be done. And then you split the difference, and depending on the reasons for doing it, you feel better or worse. I had to do what I did because I had to find out about them, but it didn't help. Even if he was a gunman, I'd given no peace to a dying man, and for that he had to die harder. A man a long way from home. Chester and I rode out into the east the way we figured Pharaoh and his wife would be headed. Sun's coming up, Mr. Dillon. I got eyes. Yes, sir. There's a homestead up around the bend. We'll stop and find out if they've seen anything. Uh, no more than a half hour ago, Marshal. I was fixing to fetch some water when I heard them. They stopped, huh? Yeah. The woman looked tuckered out. Never see a woman with all them skirts ride, ride the way she did. It was some picture. How long did they stay? Five minutes, maybe. Wife had some coffee, and they drank it, scalded, and then took off. Headed east? Mm, yeah. They wanted to know how far to Kinsley, or maybe they wanted to know the next station, and I told them Kinsley. I don't know. Santa Fe is due in there for Hutchinson about eight. They do something wrong, Marshal? Just four murders back in Dodge. Come on, Chester. The Pharaohs had enough start on us that if they got the train in Kinsley before we caught up, we'd have to use the telegraph and hope they could be stopped further down the line. With killers like that, there'd be a lot of shooting. And I figured it was my job to be there when it happened. We rode hard. 
and it lacked a couple of minutes before eight when we saw the smoke of the engine. We still had a couple of miles to go to reach the station, and she was moving out when we got there. I swung aboard and held out a hand for Chester. My, running like that, give me a stitch in the side. And the puffs. Uh, take it easy, Chester. I sure wish we'd have had time to find out if they's on this train, Mr. Dillon. If they ain't, we've lost them good. Well, we'll see. Now, look, there's a lot of people in those cars up ahead. The Ferris see us, and they're going to start shooting. And I don't want that. So go slow. If we see them first, get out of sight. We'll wait until they get off the train. Yes, sir. Okay. No, Chester, put away the gun. No shooting on the train. Yes, Mr. Dillon. We started from the last car and moved up. That way they wouldn't see us first. I hoped we could get them without any gunplay at all. Mostly for folks who would get hurt. But I didn't have any stomach for shooting a woman, even if she was a killer. We got to the third car when Chester spotted them. There they are, Mr. Dillon. All right, get back. Okay, we'll just stay here. Conductor's coming this way. Good. Well, howdy, Marshal. Mr. Heinsohn. You on a pleasure ride or business? Business, Mr. Heinsohn. That couple there in the fourth, fifth seat from the front. The tall gent? Yeah, and the woman. Yeah, I wondered about them when they got on. Sure are a funny pair. She looks plumb wore out. They both done murder. Oh, Marshal, there's kids in the car. I want to get them without any shooting. As long as they don't see us, it'll be all right. Now, where's your next stop? About 30 miles down the line. Yeah. Well, we'll try to figure something out. I hope you can, Marshal. The train rolled on. I saw Miss Farah take a kid on her lap, play with it. And the mother in the next seat looked on with fond eyes. I wonder what she would have said if she knew... Jack Farrow just looked out the window. We didn't make a move at the next stop. Two men got off, and there were still some 20 people left in the car besides the killers. About 15 miles beyond, the train pulled up again. I could see a big herd of cattle crossing the tracks. It was going to take a few minutes. Mr. Heinsohn came down the aisle to the platform where we were standing. Hey, Marshal, I got an idea. See what you think. Yeah? We'll be about 10 minutes waiting until that herd gets across. How about if I tell the folks in the car they can get out stretched legs for a bit? Might give you a chance. All right, go ahead. Hey, stand there, folks. There's a little delay for a cattle crossing. If you want to get off for a spell, stretch out a bit. There's plenty of time. We watched. Slowly, one at a time, they made up their minds. The women glad to let the kids work off steam. The men to size up strange land or somebody else's herd. And they straggled out. There was one old couple that wouldn't move, though. And I saw Mr. Heinsohn making an eye and a shrug at me. Then they changed their minds and hobbled off. And I'd left the car empty except for the pharaohs, Chester, Mr. Heinsohn, and me. That's your deal, Marshal. Lucky they didn't decide to get off. I didn't think they would. All right, go ahead, Mr. Heinsohn, and get those people down the line a bit, huh? Yes, sir. All right, Chester. This ain't nothing like California, Jackie. I never seen anything so flat. How far you think it goes like this? I don't know. You know, I ain't gonna take me and Matt. Yeah. You wanna take my gun for a while? Dig him in the rib. Hold on to it. Oh, honey. I said hold on to it. All right, get your hands up, both of you high, and don't turn around. But she must have had her gun already in her hand, wanting to give it to Farrah to hold. She was fast. One minute she was upright in the seat, and then she was gone. Firing at us from behind the seat. Jackie! Jackie! All right, throw out your gun, Miss Farrow. Jackie! 
Throw out your gun and stand up. I don't want to hurt you. I'll kill you. I'll kill you! Look out, Mr. Dillon. She's going for his gun. Yeah. No, no, me! Chester, give me a hand, will you? Now stop it. Stop it. I can't! Stop it. She was like a crazy woman. It took both of us to hold her, and we couldn't even do that right until we had her handcuffed to the seat. And then she shut up. She just sat there looking at her husband's body. When we got off at the next stop to wait for the next train back to Dodge, Jack Farrow was taken away in a wagon to be buried. His wife stood by the tracks watching it as it moved off. And it wasn't until the wagon became a dust cloud out on the plain that she started to cry. Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman McDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by Anthony Ellis, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Michael Ann Barrett and Tom Tully, with John Daner, Lawrence Dobkin, and Jack Crucian. Parley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Gunsmoke is heard by our troops overseas through the facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. Scholastic standards are rigid at Madison High. You must have a sense of humor to attend. Listen in to Eve Arden as English teaching our Miss Brooks any Sunday evening and you'll get the point. When Eve takes over the class, everybody's favorite subject is comedy. So don't forget your Sunday Eve is our Miss Brooks over most of these same CBS radio stations. Be sure to enjoy her tomorrow night. George Walsh speaking. America's 45 million radio families listen most to the CBS radio network. <laughs>